Thanks very much to the Las Casas Institute for um, asking me along uh, to speak uh, in the wake of uh, such distinguished company as uh, Ryan Williams. Um, I have written a paper um, uh, which I think will be available at some point um, and my tendency is then to give a talk which has got nothing to do with the paper at all <laughs> so you are getting uh, two for the price of one. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I will try and stick to some of the general themes which I've set out uh, in this paper, but might go beyond that. I'm planning to speak for about 35, 40 minutes, but then I'd very much appreciate any questions or uh, comments uh, that, that anyone might have. So, uh, in preparing for this uh, talk, I had to, of course, uh, do some little research on Bartolomé de las Casas, and I was lucky enough to come across a lecture by the uh, Notre Dame academic uh, Paolo Carozza who um, uh, in his uh, lecture described uh, Bartolomé de las Casas as the first notable American proponent of the idea of human rights. This is very handy given that I practice in the area of human rights. Um, uh, but he then goes on, admittedly he meshed theory and practice in a way that can make it rather difficult uh, to synthesize his views and he says, these views are not set out in any patient and systematic manner with the rigour of a philosopher, uh, but rather he has a litigator's focus on practical results uh, sought in the dispute at hand. So, and he says he grabs arguments from a whole series of eclectic sources. So I felt, who are you talking about? Um, <laughs> Bartolome and I are as one on that. I am very much a litigator, not a philosopher. Uh, and the, uh, my thinking on uh, the issues which have, have arisen here have really arisen uh, from my experience in uh, various forms of litigation uh, in the area of human rights, in the area of religious liberty, and in the area of uh, European uh, Union uh, law and in constitutional law. And what I want to set out, and it's an idea which occurred to me, frankly, only on Sunday, um, is that constitutions, what are constitutions for? And it suddenly struck me with the force of revelation that they can be described as mechanisms which are intended to preserve difference and also to resolve differences. Now, always handy with a little paradox like that. But what do I mean by that? Again, I was looking back at the life of Bartolomé de las Casas, uh, born in the 18, uh, 1480s uh, in uh, uh, Spain. As I say, a time of very interesting developments constitutionally, I, from a constitutional law uh, point of view. In 1498, as an eight-year-old, uh, 1492, what happens in Spain? There are some very, very interesting, profound uh, developments. First of all, uh, it is the, uh, the loss, the fall of the last uh, Muslim uh, kingdom uh, in Spain, the, the fall of Granada. The Reconquista, the Christian Reconquista has uh, succeeded and the Iberian Peninsula is taken back uh, for Christ. And as part of all that taking back uh, for Christ, the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, pronounced the Edict of Alhambra, uh, requiring that all still practicing uh, Jews who had previously already been herded into ghettos uh, convert uh, to Catholicism or else uh, be banished uh, from uh, the country of Sepharad or Spain. So, what kind of constitutional vision is going on there? And it seemed to me that it was one which did not allow for difference, which required uniformity, which saw difference as subversive uh, of the state, of the polity. And that in order to ensure a stable polity, uh, one, had to, one had to cause the eradication of, of difference in terms of the long-standing uh, Muslim population in, and the very long-standing uh, Jewish population, all had to subsume to one worldview, 
uh, one loyalty, uh, one crown. But in that same momentous year of 1492, with the discovery of uh, the Americas by uh, the Genoese uh, merchant, commissioned again by the Catholic monarchs, what uh, we are faced with is in the new world a whole new panoply of difference. Uh, Montaigne also uh, looks at this, uh, but we have a whole different history of civilizations, of cultures, of languages, of religions, of practices, which uh, faces uh, those first primarily uh, Spanish conquistador uh, coming over to uh, claim the New World uh, for, again for the Spanish crown. And of course, it's in that, uh, in that meeting of the old and new world that Bartolomé das Casas eventually uh, looks at the importance of the preservation of difference, the respect for uh, the cultures of others, rather than the enforced imposition of uniformity, uh, which had already characterized uh, the Iberian Peninsula, and which in fact then became uh, official Spanish policy in the Americas as well, with the extirpation of religious difference, of language, of customs, with the peoples practicing it regarded as less than human, with therefore the justification being given for their own good, uh, for their enslavement, for the exaction of forced labor, for their compulsory uh, conversions. And it's in response to those practices that Las Casas objects. And in his litigator case sensitive way says and proclaims that all races of men are one, each individual, there is one definition. The one common factor is rationality. That is, which, that is what makes us one. All have understanding, all are based in the image and likeness of God. And part of that respect for those individuals is to respect their differences. And that is what the constitution of Spain and this constitution of Spain in the Americas should be seeking uh, to achieve. And of course, as we know, he was not uh, ultimately uh, successful uh, in his own lifetime, but those ideas uh, germinate and have borne fruit, uh, it seems to me. And that they have a contemporary resonance uh, in the idea of the constitution as a, as a instrument, which is here uh, to preserve difference. Now, what do we mean by difference? We, sometimes we talk about diversity. I remember appearing uh, before uh, the Supreme Court in a case uh, a couple of years ago uh, involving, uh, involving an individual whose life had not gone well. And I, I won't go into the details, but her life uh, was characterized by fragility, uh, by uh, mental instability, uh, by poverty. And I found myself arguing before a court that was, I found rather unsympathetic to the particular argument I was putting forward. And it suddenly struck me, I was arguing before five very successful, top of their careers, upper middle class, late middle aged, privately educated white Englishmen. And was a certain, therefore, uniformity of approach uh, in their, perhaps, suppositions and a constant, perhaps, inability to see themselves in others' shoes. At least that's how it felt to me uh, at the time. But of course, as, as Richard said, because I'm not English, I'm Scottish. I have the glories of a multiplicity of identities at my fingertips. I was born uh, to it. Um, as a Scot, one knows the difference between being Scottish and British. You can be both, they're not either or. And I'm all sorts of other things. I could say, if I wanted to talk about myself, and who doesn't, uh, <laughs> that one can, if I had to, sum myself up in, well, why don't I just run a few phrases together? I'm a 
non-disabled, orphaned, white, childless, civilly partnered, multiply siblinged, many nephewed and cousined, cisgendered, Scottish, gay, male, Irish, Catholic, religiously educated, lay, European lawyer of mining stock, born in the 1960s. How individual is that? <laughs> <laughs> but we're all individuals, uh, to quote the life of Brian. Um, and we can all of us, in a sense, use all sorts of adjectives to point out our difference uh, from uh, one another and to expound on who it is that we are, while at the same time claiming, just because you know that doesn't mean that you know me. But interestingly, many of those labels uh, which I have used as being at some level significant in my own self-identification and also perhaps how people might describe me are characteristics which are now listed as protected characteristics in terms of our primary equality law statute, the Equality Law, the Equality Act of 2010. That lists the following characteristics as being protected, which means it is unlawful uh, for there to be discrimination in terms of employment, in the workplace, in the provision of uh, goods and services and facilities uh, to individuals on grounds, uh, the following grounds, at least age, disability, gender reassignment or gender identification, marriage or civil partnership status, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion or belief, sex or sexual orientation. So a whole omnium gatherum of different aspects of uh, what might be said as self-definitional aspects of uh, the self are brought in here. And within the uh, access to the public sphere, uh, the, uh, there is a prohibition on taking these matters into account for the purposes of, as I say, the uh, access to the workplace uh, provision of uh, goods and services. Now, it does seem like a, a strange, odd gathering of things together, but one can, I think, one has to start and work out and always consider what the genesis is of uh, equality law. Why is it that it now uh, is seen as a central part of our constitution? Uh, in one case, uh, Lord Mance, one of our uh, judges of the Supreme Court, said that uh, the fundamental principle of the United Kingdom Constitution is equality. Well, that's slightly odd because the whole history of the United Kingdom Constitution from Magna Carta onwards has been one of inequality. But there it is. The story we now tell ourselves of where we are now is equality of treatment. And this the Equality Act sets out uh, what it means by uh, one should not take into account uh, issues such as uh, one has to be, as it were, uh, treat men and women equally regardless of their sex. You have to be colour blind and have no reference uh, to uh, race. Uh, you have to treat young and old equally. Uh, sexual orientation discrimination means that the gay and straight uh, and anything in between has to be treated uh, without uh, distinction in the same way. Uh, those who identify as trans are given protection, though those who, those who identify as uh, cis, as in cisgender, not as in sissy, um, are uh, not given the same protection. Um, so it's not necessarily totally reciprocal disability. There is a requirement to make uh, reasonable adjustments. It, the law doesn't pretend that the abled and the differently abled or disabled uh, have to be treated equally, but that proper account has to be taken of uh, differences uh, in ability. Um, marriage and civil partnership have to be treated uh, in the same way, uh, although there is no prohibition against people because they're single, strangely enough, uh, but doubtless that will eventually uh, come in. Um, so that's the equality law that we now have. And as I say, to understand the genesis of equality law is quite interesting because in a sense, it came in uh, as a result of a peculiarly and particularly American experience. It was a response to a shamed response ultimately by the federal government uh, uh, in response to the civil rights movement uh, 
uh, in uh, uh, the United States from the 50s and 60s onwards, where at last uh, the oppressed black population, and particularly of the southern states below the Mason-Dixon line, uh, gathered together and protested against the apartheid uh, legal system under which uh, they were oppressed, which resulted in their uh, disenfranchisement, their uh, inadequate uh, education, their having to sit at the back of the bus, they're not being allowed to share public fountains. They're having a different entrance if they wanted to go uh, to a drugstore or a soda fountain. They had to use different uh, bathrooms. And the reason I say that the, the response ultimately was that the federal government was shamed into doing something because it had let that happen. It had let those legal uh, discriminations embodied in law occur. And the problem was that the federal government had failed to live up to, and the state governments to the promises uh, which had been set out in the American uh, Constitution and the American Declaration of Independence, which talked of uh, basically equality, equality of treatment. All men are created equally said, uh, unless uh, they happen to be black, enslaved, and unless they happen to be women. Uh, but there it is. There's been a constant then uh, ideal, at least, set out that ultimately uh, uh, there should be equality of treatment and no discrimination. And the interesting thing about those uh, protected characteristics, which are now protected under the Equality Act, is that yes, they can be used to describe and define oneself. We can all define ourselves in different ways according to those terms but they're not just about who we are as individuals. It's also about who we see ourselves in terms of community. So that uh, one might well say, I am black. Well, one can equally and more profoundly say, we are black and black lives matter. That those characteristics which are protected are not simply about you as an individual, but as you in relationship to others uh, of uh, like mind or like characteristic of being in community. So those labels can actually be quite useful uh, as a way into the idea of having spaces, communities, places, forms of life in which one can flourish as an individual, but as an individual in community. Uh, of other uh, uh, like uh, people. And I underline that notion of being in a variety of communities uh, because it is not simply all to do with the individual vis-a-vis -vis the relationship with the state, which is sometimes what appears to be when we talk about equality law, it's the state imposing its liberal views uh, of uh, how one should treat uh, people of different sexualities or gender identifications on, on the rest of us. Uh, but it is also, I think, part and parcel and tied up uh, with a rejection of the totalitarian state. Because one has not only to understand equality law in terms of uh, the particular American experience of the 1960s, which then expanding outwards to different characteristics, but one also has to see it in terms of the development of... Uh, fundamental rights, the recognition of fundamental rights uh, which limit state action, which say to the state thus far and no further. So equality and human rights law are sometimes just banded together and they, and they are in the name of the very government agency which protects these matters, the Equality and Human Rights Commission. But in fact they're doing not only have a different genesis they, we've seen that equality law comes from the idea of the state not doing enough to protect those within its uh, care and territory. But that human rights law is a case which developed as a result of the state doing too much, of becoming totalitarian in its approach, of using the forms of law to actually suppress difference and form in different forms of life uh, and the like. The um, 
Mussolini um, stated that the, uh, his, his philosophy of fascism uh, could be summed up, or totalitarian fascism could be summed up uh, in the phrase that um, uh, tutto nello Stato, niente al di fuori dello Stato, nulla contra lo Stato. So everything in the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. And as part of that totalitarian tendency, then all different forms of life were then suppressed and that all one's relationships were qua individual to the state and such associations as were allowed were state associations. There was no possibility of establishing one's difference uh, and banding together with the like-minded. Everything was, was in and for the uh, purposes uh, of the state. And of course, what happened in response to that in Italy was the very much the development uh, within Catholic social teaching of the idea, contrary to totalitarianism, of subsidiarity, uh, taken from German social uh, uh, law of the 19th century, but picked up very much and pushed in the various uh, uh, papal encyclicals, Quadragesimo Anno comes immediately to mind. But the general proposition there was that the state should not be totalitarian. It should not seek to arrogate to itself all power. It should not become an idol. It, instead, the state's responsibility was to allow power to cascade down to the lowest level and also to allow individuals to form such natural associations as uh, they felt uh, requ was required for their human flourishing. And the fundamental natural association uh, was, of course, uh, seen as uh, to be uh, the family. <coughs> so we have, uh, as I say, uh, in the development of equality and human rights law, also the idea uh, of subsidiarity, of the rejection of the totalitarian state. And on that analysis, then, in a sense, what becomes the most important fundamental right is the right of free association, that individuals should be able to join and form uh, such societies as they uh, wish to create uh, and envision a particular view of uh, human flourishing. And of course, uh, one can see that as a description of the church, churches, faith communities. Freedom of association is tied centrally uh, to the idea of freedom of religion. And the interesting thing about freedom of religion as interpreted in the, in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights is that it is certainly has an individual aspect. Each individual can choose which religious beliefs or uh, philosophical beliefs they may wish to uh, have. But importantly, uh, the case law recognizes that religion is expressed in community and that part of allowing for freedom of religion uh, means allowing a space for religious communities banding together to be recognized and protected and allow their particular uh, forms and visions of life uh, to flourish within those communities. And the court says that the idea of pluralism, of a multiplicity of different communities is tied up. It's uh, in the very idea of democracy. It says that pluralism is built on a recognition and respect for diversity, the dynamics of cultural traditions, ethnic and cultural identities, religious beliefs, artistic, literary and socio-economic ideas and concepts. So the idea is that there are all these visions of life uh, which are out there, which as individuals within a democratic society, uh, we are uh, seeking to determine our best place for human flourishing, but we, must, we might best do that in forming associations with others, notably uh, religiously based uh, institutions. And that is part and parcel of what it is to be a democracy as part of that rejection of totalitarianism. And the courts, even our own Supreme Court, has been uh, persuaded uh, sometimes to come out with some grander rhetoric uh, about uh, the rejection of totalitarianism. In one case uh, I was in, the court says, the first thing that a totalitarian regime tries to do is to get at the children uh, 
to distance them from the subversive varied influences of their families and indoctrinate them in the rulers' views of the world. But in a free and democratic society, we value diversity and individuality. As was said, in one case, the child is not the mere creature uh, of the state. So, we have this idea then that, that the, uh, the, there is a, the state seeks to protect individuals and communities in their various uh, forms of expression of their worldview, uh, which might uh, be religiously informed, it might be politically informed, but the idea is that there's a whole series of different of forms of life, different forms of community, uh, different uh, uh, families, uh, different ways of associating and the state to be democratic has to protect that. But then, of course, as I said, it's all very well the preservation of differences being the role of the Constitution. But then, in the, in the preservation of all that difference, there is then the potential for differences that they necessarily involve different views on uh, how the world might be and how uh, things politically uh, should be expressed uh, and the like. So how then uh, are those differences uh, to be uh, resolved? It's often said, uh, for example, that equality law is uh, opposed to uh, religious uh, freedom and religious views. Uh, we have examples of, um, uh, for example, the various uh, adoption agencies which had been set up uh, historically uh, by the Catholic Church uh, in England uh, and Wales and in Scotland, uh, when the uh, regulations on non-discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation uh, were brought in, uh, then the, uh, if and insofar those adoption agencies refused to consider the possibility of adoption uh, by same-sex couples and now uh, by couples in uh, same-sex marriages, uh, then they were said to be in breach of equality law and therefore uh, had to uh, close down. There was a clash uh, exemplified, I think, in a case brought by uh, the Bishop of Leeds um, in the sense that he said, if you force us to uh, make this change and to be blind to sexuality when our view of the world is one in which uh, the best place for a child to be brought up is in a, now one has to say, heterosexual uh, married uh, couple, preferably of, of religious faith. Uh, if you force us to change that, then you are uh, forcing us to be in breach of Catholic canon law the adoption agencies can no longer be recognised as Catholic. They will no longer receive the institutional support of the Catholic Church, nor the uh, financial support of the Catholic uh, faithful, and will simply become, instead of an expression of uh, the mission of the Catholic Church and an expression of the manifestation of religious belief in charitable works, they will simply become uh, another NGO doing uh, the work of the state. Now, that certainly is uh, a tension and is a tension which uh, continues uh, as various uh, religious groups uh, feel that they are being subject to uh, scrutiny and are not able to express uh, their uh, religious beliefs in the way that they might. Now, it is clear that, for example, on the issue of sexual orientation on religious grounds, uh, that individuals have no protection uh, if and insofar as they are going to offer their services to the public. For example, a, a, a well-known case of a, a bed and breakfast in uh, Cornwall, which had a, uh, a policy of only renting out rooms with a as the Italians would say, letto matrimoniale, uh, a double bed, uh, to those whom they recognise as being in, a, in this state of matrimoniale. Um, um, so it was not the place for a dirty weekend, basically. But this, this had been, um, uh, this is a policy that existed from the 1970s onwards. Um, and if you wanted, Mr and Mrs Smith had to bring their marriage certificates along if they wanted that double uh, bed. Um, the issue which then arose is, of course, that a, 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 a same-sex couple uh, 
uh, who had entered into a civil partnership, strangely um, ended up at the bed and breakfast, <laughs> having booked a room without apparently looking at the website very carefully. And then when saying, good evening, could we have our Leto Matrimoniale? They said, but, but you're not married. And the couple said, but we're civilly partnered. And the B&B &B owners were saying, we're not quite sure what that is, but you're not married, so um, we'll give you a room with two single beds, uh, or even two separate rooms. Um, but the, the couple uh, then said no, um, and uh, rather than find another bed and breakfast, went to the police and reported them for sexual orientation discrimination. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court. I have to uh, uh, confess my own participation. I appeared for the, for the, for the couple in the Supreme Court, and I lost, yeah. so I'm not bitter. Um, but uh, it, was, it became clear from that that uh, uh, the court said one cannot... Our, our polity that we have does not allow uh, for individuals, however religiously motivated, uh, to act in a way which either directly or indirectly discriminates against people on grounds of their sexual orientation, and that in particular civil partnership has to be treated for all purposes with a parity of esteem uh, as, uh, as uh, marriage between an opposite sex uh, couple. But there is a tension, however, an unexplored tension or, or possibility for development uh, against the idea of uh, what I was saying before of subsidiarity. That at the same time, uh, human rights law, as I've said, expressly protects the idea that organisations, associations can get together and have their own particular visions and statements of belief and act upon those. There's been quite a number of cases, in fact, from uh, Russia, which has had problems, problems, um, with dealing with uh, Christians who are not of the orthodox uh, tradition. So, talking the Salvation Army here, as well as uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and ultimately the Scientologists, but they're at the forefront of religious liberty issues. The uh, Moscow branch of the Salvation Army was refused re-registration as a legal entity, which meant it could no longer do its charitable work of working among alcoholic down and outs in the Kremlin. And uh, <laughs> the, um, the, the case went before the European Court of Human Rights, and it said very much so that, 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 that works in the community as a whole uh, are expressions of religious belief, and that therefore are protected under Article 9 and that the registration and recognition as legal entities in whichever way you wish to register is something which is protected under Article 9. No matter how you have registered, in which legal form you have registered, if your purpose is to carry out uh, works which are religiously, which are an expression of your religious belief. So that kind of argument, which is to say that um, the adoption agencies I mentioned uh, before, which say actually the, our history of having been set up is very much originally as a way of providing uh, a service to the widowed and the orphaned uh, in our community initially, um, and that it is an expression of uh, religious belief clearly backed by any number of uh, scriptural quotations, and that we're not providing an adoption service we're expressing a religious uh, belief in the protection of widows and orphans as a religiously mandated duty. And that therefore for you, the state, to refuse to recognise us, to take away our recognition, is an attack on our religious uh, freedoms and rights. And that you should be very cheery uh, about doing that. This is an argument which I in fact ran in Glasgow uh, before, uh, in relation to the Scottish Catholic Adoption Agency uh, based uh, in the Archdiocese of Glasgow and surrounding diocese, uh, and it was ultimately accepted. So strangely, there is now still one adoption agency um, in the United Kingdom which uh, has not been, which still calls itself Catholic, is still able to operate uh, and has not been required to change its uh, foundations and requirements uh, in a way which it says is contrary to canon law and its own uh, religious beliefs. So, the point is that the idea of subsidiarity 
of freedom of association being a fundamental right uh, can be a useful part of the dialectic in negotiating, in disputing uh, with any kind of monolithic uh, vision uh, of the state in insisting on a particular vision uh, which has to be replicated throughout the state because that is for the state itself to fall into the very model of totalitarian approaches uh, which has been deprecated and said to be absolutely contrary to the uh, very basis of uh, both uh, preserving difference and resolving differences, which is, I say, is what constitutions uh, seek to do. Now, of course, there are limits. There are limits to uh, that idea of diversity. There are some ideas which the European Court of Human Rights has said are, are, are so extreme as to be contrary to the pluralism that one would wish. So there is a, as it were, only so far that the intolerant will be tolerated. But the principle is that all should be tolerated until such time as the kind of toleration that one is looking for uh, is uh, so, uh, the intolerant are so intolerant as, as to undermine the very democratic bases of the society which you're trying to preserve. But what it's always saying to the state is, is yes, have a vision, uh, a moral vision, but don't necessarily completely impose that, uh, at least in relation to uh, those associations which have been formed, which seek to preserve uh, other ways and other traditions because we're all in dialogue. There are no final answers. The whole point about uh, the democratic process is to say that we are a, in a continuing journey of disputation and experimentation and trying ultimately uh, in the journey to seek uh, the good society, but not something which we will uh, ever completely uh, attain. So that's my vision of what a constitution should be doing, uh, ideally, uh, preserving difference and resolving differences. So how well uh, is our own constitution doing insofar as we have one? Well, we do know we have one now, thankfully thanks to European Union law. Um, the Miller case, uh, which you'll all have heard of, uh, a decision of the, um, again, ultimately Supreme Court sitting en banc in the 11 judges for the first time. Um, the issue of what was the constitution came centrally before the court because Article 50 of the Treaty on the European Union uh, says that a state the United Kingdom, may withdraw from the European Union in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. So it suddenly thinks, oh my God, what are those constitutional requirements? <laughs> Where is a constitution when you need one? Um, so the case uh, did go uh, before uh, the uh, Supreme Court and it came out with, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, I'm sorry, okay, it was 11 of the cleverest judges, the cleverest lawyers in the country, but it's really not a very good decision um, in terms of its sensitivity to the kind of difference which I was talking about. Because part of the difference that we have in the United Kingdom, United Kingdom, the clues in the name, is that there are a variety of constitutional histories, constitutional traditions, ways in how we situate ourselves um, some levels, as a result, uh, constitutional law has been the law that dare not speak its name, precisely because as soon as you start talking about it, then people say, that's nothing to do with our constitution. So, Magna Carta. It didn't apply in Scotland, though it was signed by a Scotsman at one point. But anyway, um, it, it has no constitutional resonance. The Scottish nationals would say, what about the Declaration of Arbroath? Uh, which goes down very well um, uh, south of the border. What are they talking about? Um, <laughs> the, um, but, but why can't we all just unite around the glorious revolution? I mean, after all, the claim of right, 1688, or the, the Bill of Rights of 1688, the claim of right of 1689. Does anyone ever read these things? Unfortunately, I do. Um, um, but that question was put to the Northern Irish claimants. I said, well, why can't we just all agree about the importance of 1689? And the response was, have you ever been in Northern Ireland in July on the anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne in 1689? It's not a happy place. 
it's not a good place to start off from your constitutional fundamentals, especially not one which says that we're talking about equality of treatment and respect uh, for uh, diversity. But all those niggling Celtic fringy kind of objections were steamrolled uh, in the vision of the constitution that was put forward, I'm afraid, and which won in the Miller uh, decision from all 11 judges, which is that the, the one thing that we can agree on is that Parliament is absolutely sovereign. Um, because, well, just because. Um, um, we, don't have a, we don't have a written constitution, so... Um, so the Parliament can do it exactly what it wants, apart from bind future parliaments. So, so effectively, the constitution that we have, and although uh, uh, Gina Miller won in our case because it was a vindication of the rights of Parliament, uh, I, which Parliament itself seemed unable to assert uh, uh, over the uh, claims of the Crown prerogative, I mean, what year are we in? Anyway... Um, back to the future indeed um, uh, but what, what resulted was a very very thin view and again I have, to, I have to confess I was in the case they didn't take any of my arguments which were uh, based on uh, the Scottish constitutional tradition but they did ask me to write on that so I wrote on it and then and they didn't bother to mention it but anyway there it is um, uh, we have a very, very thin constitutional structure, which is not actually normative in any sense. It's simply a description of what Parliament permits from time to time, from day to day. And that is worrying, actually, if that's all we can hold on to. Because it means then that there is nothing enforceable uh, about any kind of protection against precisely uh, the abuses of majoritarianism. Uh, which uh, might uh, well arise and which we've seen in earlier uh, in the history of, of, of European uh, politics in the 20th century, uh, that there are no, one cannot, uh, in this country at least, uh, go to law to seek to protect the rights of the individual or the associations which live within the society. That is a major change because while we have been members of the European Union, uh, where, the, where the whole structure of the European Union has been one of the idea that law trumps politics, that fundamental rights can be prayed in aid even against the actions of one's own government and the legislation of one's own parliament, uh, where it is necessary uh, to protect those rights, those minorities, those individuals against uh, abuse of their rights or simply ignorance of their rights, one has been able to go to the courts um, uh, and in the case of if you were within the ambit of a European Union law, require that the offending law be disapplied. That's all of that is being lost. The European Union withdrawal bill says in terms in clause five and uh, the, the European Union's fundamental uh, uh, charter of fundamental rights will no longer be law. 50 substantive rights which we have benefited from even if we didn't know about it because you don't all go to court unfortunately um, are being taken away with no parliamentary worry no public discussion no real scrutiny um, so I'm afraid my conclusion and it has been a bleak day today actually whenever I come down to it I can't really see the chink of light is that ultimately Ferdinand and Isabella would feel entirely at home in the contemporary uh, United Kingdom. Their absolutist vision is uh, regnant, uh, and Bartolome de las Casas still has work to do. Thank you very much. Thank you.